Hi everyone. If you're out there watching this, welcome to the first episode of Looking Around, Random Visits in Art History. My name is Gerald Panio, and I'll be your host. Today's featured work is a small painting with a very long title by a 19th century French artist who isn't even mentioned in most one-volume art histories or biographical dictionaries. That artist is Nicolas Gosse, and the full title of his painting is, hold your breath, Napoleon III inspecting the building site of the Pavillon de Flore, the architect Le Fuel with the plans next to him, and the old western facade of Le Mercier's clock tower in Lescaux's Louvre. In front of that is the Carousel Triumphal Arch. Gosse's painting is actually found in the Musée du Louvre and dates from 1854. It's oil on canvas and, at 34 centimeters by 23 centimeters, about the size of an average scrapbook. Let's begin with the one question that will be the start of this and any future episodes. Why choose this particular work of art? This time around, I actually have four reasons. The first was that I'd never heard of the artist. The second was that the painting seemed vaguely familiar, but I wasn't sure why. The third was that the painting featured one of the world's greatest museums, with a history going back a thousand years. And the last was that I realized I really didn't know anything about the painting subject, Napoleon III. I'll touch on all four of these topics as we go along, but let's begin with the painting itself. Thinking in terms of genre, this is obviously a history painting. It features a major historical figure connected to a significant cultural event. Unlike traditional historical paintings, however, which can be massive in size and often cover entire walls, the cinemascope of their day, Gosses would almost fit into a briefcase. Why so small? I can't say for sure, but I suspect that Goss simply wasn't successful enough as an artist to be able to afford to work on the scale of some of his contemporaries. And most of his clients may have been among the well-to-do, but not the fabulously rich. Goss was, perhaps, husbanding his resources, tailoring his work to his market. Looking at the overall design, we see that the painting is split halfway up by the strong horizontal of the Louvre Pavilion in the background, contrasting the pale sky and clouds with the larger, darker groupings of figures below. Curiously, the painting's symmetry and its focus on Napoleon III is broken by the high scaffolding on the right-hand side, which draws the eye upwards and away from the crowd below. That oddly placed scaffolding was the first thing that caught my eye when I came across this painting in A History of the Louvre. The eye's movement upwards and towards the right is also reinforced by the slight diagonal alignment of the figures in the painting. Those on the left stand on the level ground, while the majority, including Napoleon himself, stand on a raised pile of earth. Dark suited and top hatted, he's the only one wearing a hat, Napoleon III is dead center in the painting, separated from the workers, who are dressed in contrasting white and pale shades of blue and brown, and back directly at his right elbow by the dark-suited architects. Yet despite the fact that the emperor has the dominant central position, Goss has made at least two of the workmen, one on the left leaning on a stone and one on the right kneeling on the ground, physically larger and more imposing than the emperor. Odd, isn't it? How many history paintings feature a ruler looking frailer than his subjects? I mentioned that one of the things that drew me to this painting was a sense of deja vu. I was sure I had seen something like it before somewhere. The key was that kneeling worker. Where had I seen him before? The answer turned out to be a little closer to home than France and in an entirely different context. Check out this circa 1850 print of Jacques Cartier at the Indian village of Hochelega, present-day Montreal, in 1535. And this 1911 painting 
of Champlain trading with the Indians by Charles William Jeffreys. Should the parallels with Goss's painting really surprise us that much? History painting was a classical academic discipline and would have had its time-honored conventions passed down from one generation of art teachers to the next. Should we be surprised that workers incorporated in a scene with an emperor should have been perceived similarly to indigenous people in scenes with European explorers? Just as the explorers saw themselves as bringing Christian civilization to the heathens, so Napoleon III would have seen himself as bringing culture to the masses. This is the purest face of paternalism. Father knows best. Many of Goss's commissions later in his life came directly from Napoleon III, in whose eyes he would have likely been little more than a reliable tradesman. And that brings us to Nicholas Goss himself, a respected artist in his time, now totally eclipsed in the annals of art history by contemporaries such as David, Angra, Jericot, Delacroix, Corot, Daumier, Millet, Courbet, Turner, Constable, and Goya. The best, and virtually the only, autobiographical information I could find for Goss online was an autobiographical piece he had written for a French newspaper toward the end of his life. Goss, although proud of his achievements, felt that he'd never reached his true potential because as a youth, his family's circumstances made it impossible for him to receive the artistic training that would have set him on an early path to success. His grandfather, who was an expert in varnishing and working at royal residences, lost three houses in the French Revolution. His father set up a successful business painting lamps, but was forced into bankruptcy when one of the workers he trained set up a competing business. He had seven children, and they were all forced to live in one large room that the father split into four parts. His father was forced to work painting buildings. He was paid in food rather than money and couldn't even buy shoes for his kids. With two older brothers out working, Nicolas stayed home and helped his older sister, who made black veils. He took drawing lessons from his mother. He even sold Maybugs for spare change. At one point, his father was bedridden for nine months. His mother scrimped to even buy him paper and pencils. They burned horse bones for heat in the winter. Goss helped with his father's work whenever he could. Salvation finally came for the family when the father was hired to do decorations in the Grande Galerie of the Louvre. His father was able to pay his debts and send Nicolas to school. Several of his father's friends, history painters and sculptors, took him as a student for free. He won some prizes for his work, and these prizes helped kickstart his career. But he was also forced to give lessons, the money from which he gave to his mother. Finally, he received a major commission based on sketches he'd submitted that set him up for success. He always regretted the painter he might have become had he had a more fortunate childhood and a better artistic education. In 1810, he married a woman he deeply loved. He was made a Chevalier de la Légion d'Honneur in 1828. His favorite genre later in life was the troubadour genre, which focused around a romanticized image of the Middle Ages. In general, his work was considered academic painting. He had entered the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in 1805 and studied under François-André Vincent. He had a good sense of theatrical composition. He exhibited often at the Paris Salon from 1808 on. He was a painter under the Restoration in France between 1814 and 1830, devoting himself particularly to religious genre paintings. As well, he worked to decorate churches and for individuals for whom he did portraits, genre paintings, and easel paintings. And he also picked up commissions for the state in the form of history paintings. During his career, 
he continued to show a sense of eclecticism in his clients and his subjects while remaining close to history painting. Often employed by Louis Philippe for the Musée Historique de Versailles, he was successful uh, towards the end of his life. Several of his works can still be found at Versailles. Towards the end of his life, he also painted heads of old people, which had a lot of success in France in the second half of the 18th century. And now, what of the subject of Gauss's painting and his royal patron, Charles-Louis Napoleon Bonaparte? If I can risk a quote from a Chris Christopherson song, Napoleon III was a walking contradiction, partly truth and partly fiction. In the painting we're looking at in this episode, Goss showed his patron as he truly saw himself, the benevolent but stern ruler who sought to elevate the lives of his doting subjects by grand public works projects that reaffirmed the glories of French civilization. In the painting, the emperor stands center stage, the idol of the workers and the bourgeois gentlemen who surround him. In 1854, at the time Goss painted Louis Napoleon in front of the Louvre, that flattering portrait may not entirely have been a lie. But by the time of his death, 20 years later, it had all come undone. Goss lived to see the entire course of Napoleon III's rise and fall. Sadly, the artist left no diaries or journals to tell us what he really thought of the character, the policies, and the fate of this, his most important patron. A huge thank you to Ben Johnson for the theme music for Looking Around and for using the resources of the Ryandell Community Center Media Lab to turn the ghost of an idea into the program you've just enjoyed. For the next program, I'll go back in time almost 3,000 years to look at two pieces of sculpture created during the time of the Assyrian Empire. Please join me.